Well, I am grateful to be here today. Um, yesterday, I was wondering if I, I, actually how I was going to get here. I was with my brother and his family in Florida this past week, and we experienced temperatures of 39 degrees, which was a little ridiculous. I, I want my money back. Um, <laughs> My brother has been uh, dealing with cancer this past year, and uh, he was greatly improved uh, when I got to see him, uh, but the, the battle's not over yet. Uh, there are many other procedures that he has to go through, but I was telling Keith, we were sitting on the runway yesterday, and they had problems at the gate, and they pushed us all the way out, and then the pilot tried to go forward, and he kept slamming the brakes, and it turned out that the technicians had forgotten to engage the steering mechanism. So I was, I was happy just to get here. I was thinking, okay, I can rent a car and be home by midnight or two in the morning. So I'm glad I didn't, didn't have to do that. Well, on this first Sunday in Advent, Thanksgiving is, is barely over. You still have turkey and fixings in the, in the refrigerator. Um, but we need to be thinking about what's coming. And one of the things that we have not understood in the past is this Advent is not only thinking about the first coming of Christ, but also uh, his second coming. But the month of December is, is filled also with another uh, anniversary, uh, that December 6th, which is yeah, D-Day. Well, D-Day, actually. It's uh, not, not Pearl. When, when is Pearl Harbor Day? The 7th. The 7th, Okay. But, but D-Day, December 6th, was when they were pre preparing to invade Normandy. No, no, June, June 6th. June. Did I mess this up? You did. You did. Maybe Wikipedia uh, got Sorry. me wrong. Sorry. Okay. Well, trust me, June 6th was June 6th was, was D-Day. Thank you. I wasn't there. But it still works for my, for my introduction, because as they were preparing uh, for, for D-Day... A great deal of preparation had to go into that. Over 12 countries were involved in this, in this operation. Um, there were 156,000 troops who were prepared to land. They, when they were practicing, a statistic that I heard, were, and I hope this is correct, over 800 men died just in the practice of, of, of D-Day. There were... Uh, almost 7,000 naval vessels in the, in the ocean approaching. Uh, this took months and months and months of preparation. The weather had been bad, and they finally said, we're going to, we're going to do it. And uh, it, was, we, it was basically everything was based on this. We had to, we had to win this in order to, to free France and to, and to free all of Europe. This was the ultimate plan of salvation for Europe. But as elaborate as this plan was, God had a plan for the salvation of the world, maybe even more elaborate. And not involving just the, his allies, but involving every nation, every person on earth, every human being ever born. But God's plan went back thousands of years before, all the way back to the beginning of time, to life on earth, even before the fall, even before sin entered this earth. So picture yourself on a perfect day, maybe 72 degrees, your best day ever, everything works together, your plans come along, and you're in perfect health, not with a worry on your mind, and you're in a place that maybe is your favorite, could be the Rocky Mountains, could be Hawaii, maybe Montana, maybe even your own backyard. And that might describe how wonderful and how beautiful Eden was. God's garden. A place of perfection. A place where all your needs could, could be met. A place where we can't even imagine the beauty uh, that was there. It would be hard to understand. But this was perfection and beauty that God wanted to share with people. And that's why he created uh, Adam and Eve. That's why he created us. People that he also gave a choice whether to follow him or not. You can follow me or you can go on your own. And he put that one tree in the garden and he said, listen, you get everything else. Just don't eat of this tree. Otherwise, he would have created us as, as, as robots. So you have a choice to love me. And so as the story goes, Satan was allowed to intrude 
and suggest to Eve that God was holding out on her. He essentially said that even though this is really nice, this is beautiful, there could be more. Therefore, introducing greed, introducing that, that lust for more, that covetousness, that jealousy, even deceit. And I always wondered as I read this, didn't God know what was going on? Couldn't he have just stepped in? What, you know, couldn't he have just stopped it? Were his hands tied? And in a sense, they were. But by his own choice. Because he wanted to give us choice. He surrendered that power. And then again, thousands of years later, he would surrender that power and become <coughs> as a baby into this world. Coming as a human child. Subject to all the sin of this world. So he chose not to intervene at this point in Adam and Eve's life to give them freedom of choice. Choose perfection, choose beauty, choose daily communion with him, or, and they didn't know what the or was. God said you'll die. That should have been enough, shouldn't it? But words, these were words that Satan caused them, caused them to question. He said you won't die. But eating their fruit will make you like God. Knowing good and evil. But isn't this just like Satan? He takes something good and he twists it. That's all he can do. He can't create anything on his own. He only takes what is good and twists it. Just like the child, or maybe one of us, getting to Christmas and we get a present. And we go, oh, that's nice. What's next? Oh, that's nice. What's next? And we just tear through the presents, never satisfied. If you haven't had one of those Christmases, you will. It comes. These hearts of ours always want more. There's always that lust for more. So Adam and Eve chose, chose to risk everything. And the death they brought upon them not only impacted them, but it impacted all of the universe, all of creation. From that point on, death did enter so that people would die now. And as a scientific fact, the sun began to lose 4 million metric tons per second. And it continues. Our sun is dying and has been dying since the beginning of time. It will not last forever. And that decay affects plants, affects animals, our atmosphere, everything. Was God surprised? Was God upset? Did he want to scart, squash the earth and start over again? Did he get together with the angels like Survivor and, and vote Adam and Eve off the island? None of the above. It merely provided him another opportunity to express his love. And this is a comforting fact to show that the Satan had incomplete knowledge. Satan thought he could destroy everything right there. Maybe that's what he was thinking, but he couldn't. Because God already had a plan up his sleeve. And as Keith read in Genesis 3, right after they took the fruit off the tree, God says to the three of them standing there, I will put enmity, I will put this uh, battle between you, Satan, and Adam and Eve's offspring, and he will crush your head, meaning that's a prophecy of the Messiah and you will strike his heel. In this one verse, God himself prophesies that Satan will one day be completely defeated by his Savior, and it will come through Adam and Eve. And this should be no surprise to us as we read this story. Watch any movie, and the plot is usually that things start out good. A nemesis or an enemy enters, makes things bad, but by the end, the good guy wins. What do you think we got the idea? This is God's idea. Well, 3,300 years later or so, God speaks to the prophet Isaiah and tells, again, how this Messiah is going to enter the earth. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Why did God wait over 3,000 years to give this sign? And I don't have an answer for that. But then you begin to think about, it. okay, a virgin will be with child. If you've grown up in the church, it's just normal language, right? 
Mary was a virgin, she had a baby. But wait a minute, step outside of that for a minute. Um, virgins don't have children. It takes two people, as far as we know. We don't need to be a doctor to know that. But then he realized, God likes to take the credit. God is the one who likes to engineer miracles. Because too often, if something good happens, we call it a coincidence. Or we'd like to take the credit for it. Well, there's no way anybody's going to take the credit for a virgin bearing a child, except for God himself. God wants to leave no doubt that it's his hand that has intervened in the plans of mankind. God wants to show that it's his intervention. Now, prophecies are strange things, because I'm not sure Isaiah knew what he was saying at this point. Because oftentimes prophecies have a local fulfillment, in other words, during that period of time, but they also have a future uh, fulfillment. So only in retrospect do we, are we able to look back and go, oh yeah, that was Mary and Joseph. We, we know that. We have such a wealth of knowledge because we're on this side of history looking back. But the story gets better, but we need to back up a moment. I'm going to go back in time, even before Isaiah, 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. God speaks apparently out of, out of the blue to a guy named Abram. He lived in a time where there, was, there, was, there were no people of God. There was no written law. There were only oral stories and things passed around. No Ten Commandments. We don't really know what Abraham, Abram knew, but it must have been enough for him to obey. Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. And on and on and on. Who was Abraham? We don't know. No great person. He wasn't a king or a military leader, just an ordinary person. And that seems to be God's strategy again. It's going to be ordinary. In other words, he's not going to take the credit. God says, I'm going to take the credit. I'm going to turn Abram into something that he never imagined. So Abram obeys God by leaving his extended family in his country. For what? God doesn't tell him. He just says, I'm going to make your name great. He doesn't tell him where to go. God tells him to go to a country that he'll find out where when he gets there. That way his wife can't accuse him of being lost. I thought that was a great strategy. That's where that comes from, by the way. I know where I'm going. God's, God's, God's got it in, in control. So faith is essentially obedience without that complete knowledge. I mean, that's how we come to Christ to begin with. We don't know the whole story, but we know enough. <coughs> we know enough to commit ourselves to this God who loves us. So he had a plan. He had a plan involving this guy named Abram, a man who had a barren wife. She couldn't have children. Another miracle. It had to be because Abram had no heirs. Interesting that he would promise, make this promise to a man without children. But God said he would do it. And we can only know for sure by taking one step at a time. So secondly, there was a place that God was going to choose for the birth of the Messiah. And we think, where would we choose to have the Messiah born? Think of all the great ancient cities. Cities of Babylon, Alexandria of, of Egypt, Rome. Athens, or even Jerusalem. Why not one of these great cities? Think of the marketing campaign that God could pull off. He could get people to gather together so that this, at this great event, everybody of importance would be there. But in Micah 5, 2, this is a prophecy. He says, but you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. So God chooses Bethlehem. To go back in time and for people to read that, and they go, Bethlehem, who? Be where, where is that? It's sort of like when my wife and I, we were going camping, and we went to Sleepy Hollow State Park, just beyond here, and we drove to the little town of Piwamo. And I went, Piwamo? Who ever heard of that? Well, David has. I talked to him. He worked there. 
But it's Bethlehem is like that. Who, where is this place? Who's ever heard of that? Well, it turned out to be King David's hometown. Again, another fulfillment of prophecy. But God cho chooses things so that we can't take the credit because he knows us all too well. He knows of our arrogance. He knows of our pride. He knows how easily we forget him when things go well and how easily we blame him when things don't go our way. And so he chooses a town where he obviously gets the credit. And those who studied the scriptures knew that the Savior would be born there. You know the story of the, of, of the wise men. They said, where is he going to be born? They looked at the scriptures. They said, Bethlehem. It was all pretty well laid out. So it's becoming clear that God enjoys choosing insignificant people, normal people, and insignificant and just normal places in our eyes to perform his miracles, quite opposite of the way we think. We think, oh, who are the great Christians? We think Billy Graham. We think the Pope. We think Mother Teresa. And we wonder, how can I ever get recognized for my faith? And yet that's the point, isn't it? We're not supposed to be recognized for our faith. Everything that we do, I think that's what it means to be made in God's image. We reflect His image. So the people are drawn to Him. We're to go about our business in obedience to what we know of God and watch what He'll do through us. And sometimes despite us. But even with all the prophecies of the Messiah at the disposal in Jesus' day, they were looking in all the wrong places. Prophecies said he was going to be born of a virgin. Prophecies said he would be born uh, in Bethlehem. They, they said he'd be fairly normal looking if you look in other passages of Isaiah. You're not going to go, oh, there's a the Messiah. He's glowing. He's got this thing on his head. <laughs> that wasn't him. He just looked like a normal child. And so they were quite surprised when he got to the age of 30 and he began to preach and teach in a way that had authority. I wonder what that sounded like. What does it sound like for the Son of God to speak words that would just penetrate your heart? I think we can know by reading his word and reading it as if it's to us because it is to us. Isaiah 9, for, us, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. People of Jesus' day were blinded to their understanding of the Messiah, of the Messiah. They had an idea of what the Messiah should look like. But don't we do that too? You ever heard somebody use the phrase, the kind of God I believe in? It's like, since when do you get a chance to make up the kind of God you want to believe in? God is God by his own definition. And I just wonder, is it possible to miss God in the small, minute details of the day? Are we looking for him based on our own experience? Or are we looking him through, to him through the lens of Scripture? In the New Testament, if you remember the, the story of the Samaritan woman at the well, she experienced Jesus as a wonderful counselor when he told her all about her past. The disciples experienced Jesus as, as a mighty God when he calmed the raging storm. The demon-possessed experienced Jesus as the Prince of Peace when he drove the demons out of them. The children experienced Jesus as everlasting Father when he broke the traditions of the day and he invited them to come into his lap and he told them stories. The greatness of his government was realized when he described the kingdom of God, not in normal human terms, but in ways that can only be realized through spiritual means. So we can, we can understand God's plan for the first coming of the Messiah by looking at history. Again, we have the benefit of thousands and thousands of years. But what about the second coming? Jesus is coming back. Are we acting like the people of Jesus' day and to say, hey, everything's fine, everything's normal. We need to be looking for the signs, looking for, how can I be part of this big plan? So God has been active from the beginning. He's invited humans, us, men and women, children, to be part of his great plan. Have we accepted his invitation to be a part of things? 
Are we, can we be like Abram and just say, okay, I know enough, but I'm not quite sure where this is going to take me. Will we join them this Christmas season as partners with God in the salvation of the world? And he is coming again, and God is planning his invasion that's going to be quite different, and he'll get the date right. <laughs> don't laugh into the microphone. God will get the date right, and we don't know when that date is, and that's frustrating to us, isn't it? If we just knew, God, we could make our plans. If we just knew. But God is alive and well, and his kingdom is already upon this earth. And we can participate in that. We can participate through faith, through worship, through the activities of this church. And if we haven't been involved, doesn't it behoove us to be a part of the plan that's guaranteed to succeed? How often do you hear that? Whose plans are guaranteed? But just like on the shores of Normandy, there are risks. There are risks. Risks to your reputation, risks to your career, risks in relationships. But God does not invite us to be a part of something, even dangerous, without the promise that he will be right there with us. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, thank you for an amazing plan that we can, as we uh, look back through Scripture, we can see is just is woven through the fabric of time. It's not the way that we would have done it. But then again, that makes sense. You want the credit. You're a perfect God, with a perfect way of thinking, and, and you've made the perfect plan. And we thank you for the salvation that has come through Jesus Christ, that we can celebrate your birth during this season. But God, thank you for inviting us to be a part of even the kingdom today. And as we celebrate through the giving of gifts, through the singing of hymns, and through the, the peace that comes to those who accept you as Lord and Savior, may we invite others to come along in this journey with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us respond to God's message to us by singing, O Little Town of Bethlehem, hymn number 44. Thank you. 